Welcome to the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses all the things that schools may have missed with your hosts, AJ Kuti and Jason Gordon. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. We are the Reschooled Podcast, the show that discusses all the things that schools may not have prepared you for. As always, I'm AJ sitting across from me, Jason. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing great, AJ. It's a wonderful, wonderful spring day. No kidding. It, it's it's a little cooler than it was, but it's still pretty warm. Oh, yeah. Well, I went for a long walk this morning and the breeze was going. I think there might be a little rain on the breeze out there. It's you know been rainy for the last few days. But this morning was clear. It was cool breeze. It was amazing. Amazing. I went on a long read of an article that I had to read for class. Oh, congratulations. And still did not. <laughs> I still haven't finished it, but I'll tell you, the be- the most beautiful thing and, and it kind of works because right now I'm in the middle of a, one of my classes for the summer is a technology class. Uh-huh. So it works really well. And I'm, I'm a huge techie, but there are so many things out there that are, that make a student's life so much easier now than when it was when I was an undergrad. And it's, it's incredible. Like it, the, the audio stuff, like I, most of my stuff I'm reading or I'm supposed to be reading, I'm, I'm listening to. But you know. That's a double-edged sword, you know, like it yeah. opens up all these opportunities and stuff. But it's with me, I get analysis p- paralysis sometimes. I got so many things I could be doing, so many ways to be learning this, so many things. I'm just like, what do I do? Mm-hmm. I mean, I just kind of drop back and be like, just Jason, just read the thing. Well, just whatever's know, in front of you, just read it. <laughs> and that's funny because one of my one of my cohort members, they were talking about because I said, well, you should get the audio book because one of our class has our textbooks, which we have six textbooks, are, are just novels, but they're like, you know, nonfiction novels is, is about the stuff that we're talking about with technology and stuff like that. One of them is dealing with blockchain. And I said, why don't you just get the audiobooks for that? And they go, well, I, I can't, I can't pay attention enough to audiobooks in order to really understand it. And I'm the same way, but when I, and I, I know this sounds like redundant almost, but I have the book in front of me and I read along with the audiobook. Oh, it yeah. just yeah. makes me, it allows me to go quicker because I'm a, I'm a fairly slow reader, mm-hmm. but I can crank that bad boy up to two times and just go off and I can get it because I see it and then I also hear it. Ah, that makes sense. I've never tried that. I might try that sometime, the the reading along with somebody else reading that. It I helps me a lot because I've actually been able to increase my speed Yeah. Um, because I just see it, it working very well. So, okay. um, well, side, that was a side quest. Let's go to back to our main topic. So today's topic, we're going to be talking about reputation and more specifically, is a school's or college's reputation important? And I guess what we're saying is, is it important enough to make a decision on based on that? I have strong opinions about that, but let me remind everybody first, hit us up on the website, give us your questions, check us out on social media handles and stuff like that. We want to hear your comments about the stuff we're saying, right? Uh, it's, we're, we're in more places than just your favorite podcasting app. So check out our website. You're going to like it. And like I say, if you got the time, shoot some message. Absolutely. But AJ, yes, I have strong opinions about uh, the whole uh, you know, reputation of school and what that means and things like that. I'm I, interested it, because this is something that we, we didn't discuss our opinions on beforehand. So if we're different, this is going to come pretty interesting. This is kind of what we were saying in the last episode when we were talking about our, you know, 50 second episode, you know, we hope to get some that we're a little bit different on so we can give you both sides of the coin. So that helps kind of make your decision as a listener uh, for these topics. So let's start with a quick question as always. Um, We've talked about our schools and how, how we went about, like, you know, you said you, you applied to one, I applied to two, Um, but was your school's reputation important to you when you were deciding to attend it? In a way, yes, but not the way most people were thinking. Okay. Okay. Uh, The school I went to, and I went to the College of Charleston in South Carolina, undergraduate. It was considered a very, I I don't know, a a little bit party schoolish in a way, but more just very artsy, Mm -hmm. liberal arts focused school um, versus the other big state schools. And I like that. Uh, at the time, I just thought that would be super interesting. It was something I wasn't highly exposed to, but I always liked, right? So that aspect, yeah. But when you're talking about like the uh, academic prestige of it all, right? Like how strong are the academic programs and things like that? Was that super important to me or something I even really factored in? Um, not really. Okay, I, I started off in biology and I knew they had a biology program. And being on the coast, I knew they were pretty solid in some aspects of like marine biology and stuff like that. 
but I also knew there was a medical school in the town. I knew a lot of people that if you go to the College of Charleston, that it's, you know, they give you the percentages that a percentage of them go on to medical school. Right type thing, and I was like, "Well, that that would be perfect for me. Then I can I can do that." But as far as me looking at rankings and and employment statistics and uh, all kinds of stuff like that, I really I didn't I didn't look at that stuff at all. What about you? Now I, I as you say that I'm thinking, okay, well that makes sense because I had I uh, again I, we've said this on on the episode before I I applied to two colleges, got into both. Um, one was more prestigious. One had a very good academic reputation as a private school. Uh, the other one was a small uh, town school, a smaller school just in, in, in South Georgia. Uh, didn't have the reputation, obviously, from an overall standpoint. But obviously, like you were just talking about, the schools tend to give you these statistics of applications for. And I went through I went through chemistry. I was going through pre-med. And I knew I wanted, at that time, I wanted to go to a med school. So they're like, well, 90-something percent of students that go through our program make it into med school somewhere. I'm pretty sure I lowered that bar a little bit. Um, <laughs> I, I heard like, them. there's always one out of 10, AJ. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, if I was going on sheer reputation, I would have chosen the other school. And I'm not saying that my undergrad was, was bad by any stretch. Um, It's just, I, and maybe it was foreshadowing of where I am now teaching accounting. Uh, I, at that, even at that time I was looking at a cost benefit and we're going to talk a little bit about that too, uh, later on, but I, it, the reputation didn't match the, the resources it was going to require to get that reputation. And I was going to get just as good an education, not necessarily reputation, but education from the smaller school that I ended up going to. And I also knew uh, there were other things ahead of me. Uh, mm-hmm. Again, I was thinking I was going to, to medical school, um, which changed after two years. But, you know, it, it reputation wasn't huge to me. Mm-hmm. It was it was a, I will say this, it was a factor in saying I will be happy in the school that I did choose versus going to the more expensive, more prestigious school. Because of the reputation I, I heard them give about the percentage of going to med school, I thought, okay, I'm good with that. That was all the reputation I needed. So mm-hmm. I was happy with what they presented me, but it was not the defining piece in terms of what made me choose. Uh, I would say that would be more of the cost and location. Sure. Um, but let's get into the main topics because I think this is going to be really, like you said, it's something that you're very passionate about. You have a lot of opinions on, and I, mm-hmm. I don't, I've never really thought about it really hard until I really, I, saw the topic for today's episode and I thought, okay, this is something that I probably should have looked into a little bit more um, when I was going through school because it just didn't, I didn't, I didn't know anything. I was, I was a naive college up and coming college student and all I wanted to do is get in and get out. Yeah. Are there instances where reputation is highly important in your decision-making and then adversely, are there instances where reputation is not that important? Yes. On okay. both, on both cases and both accounts. At the same time, actually. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, we're in business and I deal with, uh, uh, you do too, but mm-hmm. I, I deal with a lot of students that I mentor because I coordinate interns, right, as well. Sure. And so I have to look at so many people in terms of what they want career-wise and what it takes to get there. I hear from students all the time, I want to go into consulting right, type thing, big firm stuff, or I want to go into a big financial firm. Matter of fact, I spent an hour and a half yesterday helping a student put together a career life plan with that specific goal in mind, right? You should have just sent them to the podcast. We had a whole episode on that. (laughs) Well, yeah, but you know, there's that hands-on, like, this is where you are, that kind of stuff. You know, it's really, uh, really helpful, you know, to go through with them and stuff. But that being said, if... And and not everybody's like this, right? Some people, people out there listening now are on the fence as to whether you're going to go to college, what you're going to get out of it, things like that. In that situation, looking towards reputation of the school only matters a slight bit, right? You need to see if the school fits and if, um, you know, you feel at home there, you feel like it's the environment you're going to thrive in, all those good things. But if you know the career path you want to go down, you know the objective, that the light at the end of the tunnel, as they say. And that could be something instilled in you by your parents or whatever, okay? But however you have it, there are instances where the school you go to 
will dramatically increase the chances of you having that opportunity to pursue the career you want. Harvard. Right. Harvard. Okay. Um, that's the, they've got the best brand of any university in the world. And, you know, in any given year, the rankings, Stanford might be better or yeah. Yale or Princeton or uh, Chicago or, or Pennsylvania might be better. MIT, you know, some of these others. Any year they might, but it, Harvard has the best name brand in the country. One of the oldest schools in the country, obviously, um, largest endowment, right? Forty billion dollars sitting in the bank, <laughs> right? To do things must with. be nice. Opportunity galore. Uh, employers recognize it as that. So you go to Harvard, you get any employment opportunity you could imagine, right? I, I you know, I, I had a English major friend that went to Princeton, right? Similar scenario, and she got job interviews with Google in technology. And she's not a technologist. She was an English major at Princeton. But the assumption there is so strong that everybody's ability there is really high so you can learn whatever. You know, lots of employers embrace that thought that it doesn't matter. Smart people can learn anything type thing. So employers use colleges so much as a human resource function, a screening function for potential future employees. And they should, right? Uh, I mean, how else are you going to differentiate who you should hire except for saying, oh, well, I'm just going to go to a place that automatically attracts talented people. And then we'll just interview them and see if they fit. And if they are, they're talented. They'll learn what they need to do. If they fit well, we'll bring them on type thing. So, you know, schools naturally use colleges for that function. Well, lots of these companies, they're not going to go to a smaller school. They're not going to recruit on that campus. It doesn't carry the name recognition in terms of getting an interview. So your opportunity there, and in a way, the opportunity that the school itself created for you is not there in other places. Now, I do firmly believe there are people at every school who are as good as people at any school. I, I really do. I, yeah, of course, I truly yeah. believe that, right? Um, uh, I've heard it from people, you know, I heard it, I first actually heard that early on from a professor I had who uh, was top of his class at Yale and Harvard, both of them, right? And he said that, he's like, the best students anywhere, the best students everywhere, right, um, type scenario. You just have a larger concentration in these more competitive schools to get into, right, in terms of their diligence, their effort, their early exposure and things like that. So long story short, my simple answer to that simple question in terms of does prestige of the school are the instances where it matters? The answer is yes. If you know exactly where you want to go in life, the reputation of your school may be a major factor in helping you get there. Okay. But if you have, if you are, you know that college is the next step and you don't know where life is going and you really need to find yourself, right? Finding a school that helps you find yourself, that fits with what you're looking for to, you know, take that next growth step is the most important factor. Going to one school versus another because of the reputation, but the fit there isn't as strong. I mean, it's very easy to get lost in college, right? It's very easy to just say, why am I doing this? Because you you don't feel like you fit. You don't feel like this works with your life. You don't know where you're going. And lots of times you're incurring a lot of debt to do it. So yeah. there's a strong disincentive sitting on top of your head the entire time about, you know, I'm burning money. I'm burning time. What am I doing? So the answer is yes in both both instances. All right. Now, your opinion. Go. I want to hear it. <laughs> so as you were talking, some things popped in my head, but my initial reaction was, in terms of instances where reputation is highly important, there are, uh, and you mentioned like the school itself, the overall school reputation. So Harvard, Yale, Columbia, all that kind of stuff. Um, if you can get into those, then obviously the reputation is second to none. Um, but I also think it kind of almost on a more micro level in terms of the degree that you're going for, I think has some kind of impact on whether uh, re reputation is important. So for instance, my old school had a an engineering degree. My my undergrad had an engineering degree. It's not going to hold water against Georgia Tech. 
Right. And that is not going to even have the same reputation. Georgia Tech's degree is not going to have the same reputation as MIT. Georgia Tech is a really good technical school. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's one of the best amazing. in the country. But, but MIT but, might be number one, right? Exactly. And so there there are certain, I, I do think there are certain degrees where you have uh, a, a higher impact on the reputation of the school if you pursue that degree. On the other side, I do think that there are certain degrees where the reputation of the school isn't necessarily the most important part. But where does that reputation come from? And that's kind of where I was, I was as you were talking, I was kind of coming into my head, is where does this reputation from the school come from? Is it coming from the students themselves because they're just so good? Or is it coming from the college? And for some colleges some universities, it does come from the university because they're so, they, they work so hard at getting placement for their students and it makes their students look good, which therefore makes them look good. And so what it goes to my mind was like nursing. You don't have to have a prestigious nursing degree or, you know, from a, from a very reputable college. You need to have a good education and a nursing degree and it's going to prepare you good enough to t- to pass the was it the the class the in class test or whatever it's called in class what I can't remember what it's called, but you have to pass that test. Once you get that, you're done. And they're not gonna they're not gonna challenge you of did you did you go to Harvard did you go to this did you go? no they just want to make sure you are you are smart enough to pass the test to get through everything you need to do. Where you get that degree from is completely and we're right now at a deficiency of nurses anyway, so they're pulling from anywhere they can get anyway. Well, I will say this, uh, and you bring up a great point. I I do want to go over next the business model behind education as to how they get their rankings and stuff. But that aspect, there is one scenario where I would say what you just said does not hold true for nurses even. And that's in the area of, well, say you need a specialized uh, nursing license, like a nurse anesthetist or something of that nature. And you have to go on to more school, a graduate degree or a doctor doctoral program for that licensure in that scenario to get into those schools the reputation of your undergraduate school does hold more weight that makes sense i didn't think about that part that makes sense so that that will come into play again i often tell students um they ask me said how important is my gpa and i say what do you want to do in life and they tell me and i'm like in your scenario no gpa is far less important than networking and uh, getting some experience in your field. Yeah. But if you want to go to grad school and what the life plan you're telling me does not include that, right? Then it's not. But if you do need to go to li- grad school to take that next step, then all of a sudden GPA becomes very important again. So that's something to always consider. All right. Next question. I don't want to pose this to well, you kind of in a scenario. Before we do, okay, go ahead. I, and I'm sorry to interrupt like this, no, but yeah, I just think what you brought up, you brought up such an amazing point about what does reputation mean anyway? And I think it's a good idea to uh, explain to everybody the yeah, business makes model sense. behind the school's sure. reputation. So just to lay it out for people in a very summary fashion, okay? Rankings are a popularity opinion. They come from major sources like U.S. News and World Reports, Princeton Review, and other specific industry-related publications, okay? Everything's about how you get the word out there, right? You create impression, and that impression is somehow formalized in a written magazine or document or something like that. So those are the rankings, right? What did these publications rank the school on? Number one, across the board is reputation of the institution with other professors. They survey other professors across that prof- that discipline, right? And the reputation of the university there. Now, what is that telling you? Most professors are not practitioners. There tends to be two tiers of professor. The practi- practicing professor, the one who has a lot of experience in the field and teaches the subject matter. And then there's the researching professor that digs deep into the topic and adds, somehow moves the ball forward on knowledge about the subject, right? Like you're doing now, right? You're in a doctoral program. You are learning to move the ball forward uh, in uh, theoretical thought about a topic, right? And that's, I was about to say, know, I'm, I'm in between those two categories right now. I'm not a practitioner and I'm not deep thought yeah, I'm but but you're definitely middle. moving in the deep thought I'm moving, direction. I'm right? moving towards that, yes. To, to be a uh, knowledge contributor, 
Okay. Oh, God, so, that's scary. And so that was the original purpose of colleges, academic institutions. Now, you, you started seeing more teaching schools where these teaching schools tend to have less researchers and more practitioner based or researchers that just are more into teaching instead. Right. And so when it comes to the national opinions, though, you're primarily going to get schools that have strong research departments. That does not mean the school has the best teachers. It means they have the best researchers. Okay. Harvard has some of the best researchers in the world. Now, they often, these schools oftentimes hire that whole second tier or second class of, of professors that are clinical professors or teaching professors, as they say, right, type scenario. So they round it out that way. And usually your best teachers are those practitioners. Sometimes you get your academics, but having spoken to so many high level R1, that's research level one schools, the researching professors don't have time to teach. They don't really want to teach. That's not their drive. That's not their motivation right? Their motivation is to move that knowledge base forward. So anyway, if you want high rankings nationally, gain the prestige, you got to have the researching element, okay? And normally that requires huge endowments, lots of money to be able to afford to pay these professors, you know, a, a, a lot of money on top of a base salary, right? You know, yeah. it's not uncommon for a solid researching professor to make anywhere from, I mean, <laughs> there was a professor in the state of Georgia here, a state school professor who led a PhD program at Georgia State that was compensated one million dollars a year. Right. So that's how, you know, in two, three, four, five, six hundred thousand dollars a year is not uncommon in lots of areas for chaired professors of um, researching professors at large schools. Right. Yeah. So that being said, right. You have to understand what they're getting ranked on. Now, the other factors after that are school placement, right, in terms of your, excuse me, placement of students with employers. So your percentage of employment within 30, 30 days or, or 90 days after graduation. OK, so that's a huge factor as well. And then, um, you know, then they'll start mixing in minor other factors. But those are the two big ones. OK, they'll look at test scores and stuff like that, which, you know, entry GPA, entry test scores, that's a ranking factor and stuff like that. But if you build up your reputation, it's all very circular. Employers start to recruit from your school because of the reputation. Right. Students start going to the school because of the reputation and, you know, that they see as future employment. So this circular nature, it all tends to start, though, with money. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The ability to pay the, these highly researching, research-based professors and the ability to hire practitioners for the clinical and the teaching track professors. You know, you and I are both at a school that's more of a teaching school, right? Yeah. We have to do a little bit of research. Um, so we try to, it, most of our stuff is pedagogical in nature, right? Um, but we try to move the ball forward in terms of teaching in our subject matter with research. But by and large, we are teachers, right? We are yep. educators first, um, researchers second. And that's not the case at the higher reputation school. So if you understand that business model, you understand what it takes to be a highly ranked school, you start to realize that if there are some things that are important to you, like like fit, personal development, fulfillment, um, uh, you know, student teacher interaction because, you know, you need that level of engagement, the small classroom size, the the students that have a, a different demographic than you're accustomed to or whatever. All of those things can be major factors in your consideration. Right. But if you're employment driven. Right. You know, no question that all I am looking for is opportunities to go to this better grad school later or opportunities to get into this job then a school with a higher reputation based upon those crazy factors I just told you about are, I mean, that's, that's going to be your driving force. So a higher reputation school is going to be a better bet for you. All right. So I know I talked yeah. for a long time uh, and <laughs> jump in there. Anywhere. No, and you may, you, you bring up good points. It's the, the reputation is perception and, and the reputation is the only to the perception of the people that you ask about the reputation. And if it's only for the professors, then they're going to look at one thing versus what maybe employers are going to look at. 
Yeah. And so, and that's, that's a defining piece, but it's still, regardless, you still have that, that public perception based on something that's going to give you that reputation. I want to pose the next question, like I said, in, in somewhat of a scenario, and it's going to be kind of a two part question. Uh, let's just say, for instance, you have identified and applied to five schools that you are wanting to go to, and you've been accepted into all five of them. Based on the information that we were just talking about, should you always go for the school that has the highest reputation possible? And if not, or another way of looking at that is, are there any costs that we should consider when it comes to the benefit of the, gaining the benefit of the reputation of the school? So good question. Um, assuming we've already established fit, right? Mm -hmm. The school offers what you're looking for and you yep. feel like you would fit at any of them. Should you go for the school with the highest reputation or, you know, always? Well, <laughs> I don't know, right? I, I don't know the best answer to that. If you're career driven, absolutely yes. If your objective there going in is, I know college is going to be a great experience. I know I'm going to learn. I know I'm going to meet people. I know I'm going to do all these amazing things. But in the end, I want to be a doctor. I want to be an engineer. I want to be whatever. And whatever it takes to get there is everything. Everything else is second. You go to a school with a better reputation. Yeah, my mind goes to, uh, so this is kind of a hint to anyone that's going into college or, or currently in college that you're in a business degree, so you're sitting in a business class, and the professor asks you a question, you give them the business answer, because that's what this question is. And the business answer is, it depends. And it always depends on something or some things. And in this one, you were just talking about, you know, if the fit works, you still can't answer that question because there's so many other factors and variables in there that you have to consider. Now, if you were to give me five colleges that have, that are equal across the board with the only difference being reputation, then I would say go to, go to the reputable one. I mean, that's, but again, there are so many variables that change. You have location, you have cost, you have, I mean, you can go into to party schools. Do you want to go to party school or not a party school? Do you want to go to um, a smaller school versus a larger school? Do you want to go to one that your friends are going to go to, or do you want to kind of go at it your, you know, alone? There are so many things out there, and I think we had an episode not too while, uh, not too long ago, that talked about the different factors in choosing a college. Mm -hmm. And in all of those factors, you cannot find five colleges that are across the board the same, with the only difference being reputation. Right. Our, and so, our hypothetical is is false from yeah, the start. It's, there, it's a there, utopian there, example. Yeah. There is so, no same, sameness across the board. There are intangibles that every school has that is going to make it a personal experience that's going to mean everything for you. And and you brought up a really good point, which leads into that second question is, is there any cost to the benefit of reputation? Is in order to gain that reputation, the college has to have the money to bring in those professors that does the research ability and has the impact and all that kind of stuff. So if you're going to go into a very highly reputable college, then you're going to be paying for it too. Yes. And that is a cost benefit analysis that you're going to have to figure out. Is it worth it? Um, I mean, it's it, and and it, the the answer to for some is yes. Again, yeah. it goes back into the first question: Is there instances? There are certain instances where that is absolutely the case. But I would say for the average, probably not. Um, in again, in in maybe half the situations that it's not necessarily the most important thing to me. And especially with what we're going through right now with the, the student loan crisis, cost is a very big factor. And oh, that's yeah. something I, I talk to my students a lot about is that you need to understand what you're getting yourself into when you're going to these places because it's not only the cost of tuition, it's the cost of living, it's the cost of food, it's the cost of tra uh, transportation, it's the cost of – I mean, you can, books are ridiculous. Now, mm. granted, a lot of them are going digital, but even that's still – you can't even sell those back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> You know, so you, you bring up such a great point, the whole cost factor there. And I said, you know, reputations based on career driven, right? A lot of that's going to be dictated by the resources you have to pursue that career and the training necessary and the licensure and everything. Everybody knows to be a doctor, it, it's very expensive, yeah. right? And people that go down that track really are, have to go through with it. They're going to earn a high wage at the end and they'll be able to pay it back. But you have to be knowledgeable and that, you know, there are going to be repercussions that if you don't see that through or you change things, right? So if you are going to pursue uh, educational path, 
make certain that there is going to be a level of return on your investment. Okay, because if there is not a return on that investment, the debt, the baggage that you carry with you afterwards can be crippling. It can actually hurt all of your opportunities. Right. I, you know, I came through school and I took I had a lot of student loans all the way through. Uh, Luckily, I was able to use scholarships and uh, then later the GI Bill from the Army to pay for a lot of my stuff. So I didn't have as much student loans as many others who have as many degrees as I have, you know. Um, But uh, so I, you know, did that cost analysis at different points in times as to what can I afford and will this be crippling to me that I cannot pursue the options that I dream of or wish to pursue because of debt. And quite frankly, you know, when I went to the Army, if I'd gone to a undergraduate and a law school that were top tier in terms of prestige and cost that were not state schools, that were private schools, I could not have afforded to go into the military because I wouldn't have been able to afford to make my student loan payments. I would have been able to do nothing other than go into big law, as they say, just to afford that. So that debt could be crippling to you if you're not careful, right? It could shut doors as easily as the reputation of the school could open doors. And that's that's a topic for another episode because I, I'm very passionate about that subject right there in terms of choosing your path based on what you want to do, but understanding kind of what the cost implications and the, the benefit implications, the financial benefit implications of that. So you don't want to go into uh, to get a degree where the job placement is very low the unemployment is very high. There's not a whole lot you can do with it because it's so specialized. Um, those are things that I'm very passionate about students understanding when they get into college because that can, I mean, there's no reason to get a $150,000 degree and you're going to be making $35,000 a year. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, it's it, it doesn't make sense. Well, one, one model at least I'm seeing change to is the, as long as you come out with technical skills and abilities, yep. there tends to always be work and always be the opportunity to build a career. It tends to be the the degree programs that don't offer hard, substantial skills that you can acquire during the program, right? You, you spend too much time learning about things, right? Uh, the Everybody picks on the humanities and liberal arts, you know. Uh, sociology, psychology, uh, philosophy, literature, English history, things like that, right? On their own, other than the ability to research and write, they don't prepare you for a career-ready or industry-ready skill, okay? So, but if you do identify, you know, like you've got an MIT, for example, or Georgia Tech. Yeah you tend to come out with very strong technical skills in your area of focus. So even if it's quite expensive for you to go there, there is still a huge potential, even if not immediately, right? A huge potential return on investment based upon the skill sets and the abilities that you require, that you acquire during the program. So usually my only caution there in terms of cost um, and things like that is making certain that the program within the school you're studying is going to once again prepare you for what you want to pursue in life and isn't going to be strictly a crippling factor for your ability to, to pursue it. Yeah. yeah. So, Last question. Are there ways to compensate for lower reputation among schools? Oh, yeah. There's other things that you can do strategy wise. And I love strategy. That's kind of why I put this question in here. Is there strategies you can use to compensate for a lack of reputation comparative to other colleges that you could have gone to? A hundred percent. I agree. As a student, you are simply piggybacking on the reputation of the school, but you are an individual. You are your own entity. You can create your own brand to the extent necessary. You don't need to piggyback on anybody's uh, coattails, I would say, or ride anyone's coattails university included. You go to a university or college that does not have a strong reputation that you can depend on in terms of going out there and making connections and and seeking opportunities in the job market. Well, create your own reputation. Network. 
about to say network, yeah. meet people, produce work product, prove your ability, show people what you're worth and it won't matter. Yeah. Right. Um, I, Think of the incredibly successful entrepreneurs that never went to college. You got your Steve Jobs, your Sir Richard Branson, your Steve Blanks, right? Um, they didn't go to they didn't go to college, but don't think for a second that they weren't capable, that they weren't brilliant, and that they didn't work incredibly hard to build their own brand, right? In order to make themselves understood, uh, their level of competency understood. So. That being said, everybody can be anything they want to be, even without, you know, unless it requires a licensure. You can't be a doctor unless you get a medical school, right? But although people have tried that before, people have tried that, right? That'll get you arrested, though. <laughs> Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we are not saying that. <laughs> but there is nothing in this world you can't do. Could you learn to be a doctor, to do all the services as a doctor without going to medical school? You certainly could. You too. <laughs> if you are dedicated enough, just don't actually do that. That yeah, will get you arrested. Don't do yes. it. But my point being is um, you have the ability to create your own reputation, to create those opportunities. Like we talked about in a prior episode, it's all about opportunity creation or generation, recognition, then exploitation, right? Those are three different things. You can do the things necessary to create opportunity for yourself. The college is one aspect of it. Going to Harvard, we keep using that name, or Stanford or Yale, wherever you want to go like that. And that does a lot to create a reputation for you. But the, a person, once again, can create their own reputation through what they do. They don't need to piggyback on the university. They don't need to piggyback on the connections that their parents have. They don't need to piggyback on those things. They go out there. They prove their mettle. They prove their worth. They prove their ability. They accomplish something on their own. And honestly, in many ways, in at least with people like me who come from a background like me, that tends to be higher respected, right? So everything you said is 100% spot on. I'm going to give you some examples of ways to compensate. And I'm going to look at it from... From one, what I did, and then two, what I've seen some students do, which I think are very, they, they worked out very well for them uh, and for me. Uh, one is if you know you're going to go into a path that's going to lead you to grad school, then you don't necessarily have to go to the most prestigious undergrad. Because when you put this stuff on your resume, the last place that they're going to, the first thing that they're going to see, because it's the highest one, is your grad school. So for me, I went to a lower, you know, smaller uh, college for undergrad, university. And then I went to a large state university for my master's program. I went to UGA. I think it's it's very well known. Um, I get the reputation from UGA, even though I went. F I was supposed to go four years in undergrad. May have went a little bit more, but four years. But I only went one year at UGA. Um, I get the I get the benefits of the reputation. Now I'm going into a doctorate program out of Marshall, which I also got accepted into another college, uh, but I chose Marshall for. Other reasons than, than reputation, reputation was very big in it, in, the, in the, uh, the, the decision, but it was also there were some other decisions that was uh, involved. Um, but Marshall's well known. I mean, they had a movie made out of it. Not a great movie. It didn't have, it wasn't a good movie because of the tragedy that happened, but it's a well-known college. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're a, bigger, they're a bigger college than the alternative. Um, so if you know you're going to go to grad school, then obviously – Take advantage of the undergrad because it's going to be cheaper. Again, I'm, I always go just back to cost benefit uh, side of it. If you're not sure, you still have options. Uh, you can still go to a lower school, a lesser known, lesser reputable school. And I say lesser reputable as if it's a bad thing. It's not. They, it's not that these colleges are bad. They just don't have the reputation as the Harvards. Um, but you go to a less lesser known school for even a couple years to get your core classes out of the way. Go to a tech school, to go, go to a community college, uh, get Absolutely. your core classes out of the way, and then go to a more prestigious. I have a lot of students who come to our school for a couple years to get the core, and then they go to uh, a higher college to be able to graduate from that college. Now, I will say this, and this is really important because I, this is something that is important to any school that, one, has this, this uh, uh, certification. Is it certification? Accreditation. Accreditation. Uh, if, if you are trying to go to a college, and I'm going to use our school for example, okay? We live in Georgia, so the big school here would be UGA. 
our school is GGC. It's a, it's a new school. So obviously we don't even have the time that, that UGA has invested in getting their reputation. Um, but UGA has an accreditation that's from uh, an, uh, an, an association called the AACSB. Do you know what AACSB stands for? Uh, I should. <laughs> I, I should, should too. <laughs> <laughs> I should too. I was just hoping you would so I wouldn't have to come up. But yeah, okay. But it's an AACSB accreditation. And it's more or less, the, the way to look at it is, it is an accreditation that is of the highest level for institutes when it comes really to teaching and researching, but more it's kind of on the research side. Uh, but it is based on whatever college, how, whatever the structure is. Um, if you are a student in a college that doesn't have the AACSB accreditation and you try to transfer to UGA, you will probably lose a lot of your hours, your credit hours, because they don't, it's not transferable when you have that accreditation. So if you're going to do that, you want to make sure that your lower school, the lower reputable school has still the AACSB accreditation so that when you do transfer to an AACSB accredited institute, a higher level or higher reputable uh, institute, that all of your uh, classes, or at least a large portion of your classes will transfer over. That's why our school was so bent on getting the AACSB, so it would help students if they wanted to go over, among other things, but it also would help students if they wanted to transfer. So um, if I were to do that, and I actually had, I went through this as a student, my undergrad did not have at the time, uh, did not have AACSB accreditation. So, and I thought about uh, transferring to UGA midway through, and I would have lost, uh, uh, I think it was a a year's worth of classes, so two semesters worth of classes. Wow. Um, versus if, and later on, it became AACSB accredited, uh, I would have lost, I think, one or two classes total. I think. So, so you bring up a really good point in terms of like long term career path, assessing the quality of the school is oftentimes based upon, you know, uh, again, indicators of quality and, uh, and accredited a, a, an accreditation, right? That's awful, accreditation, yeah. Difficult combination of words. <laughs> can be an indicator of quality, right? In terms of, because they do measure teaching, mm -hmm. access to resources, right? Um, diversity, and yes, research those things right together to evaluate the school. Uh, so there are a lot Wait, of things I, out there to help you try to assess quality. <laughs> I do. We do need to put this in there just in case anybody from our school is listening because we hear this so much and there is a focus on assurance of learning. Yeah. It, that's, that's one of the big things that they look at and, and we get harped on a lot about, and I don't want them to think we're not listening. So if, if anybody of the faculty listens to this, that they hear us, we, we do, we do listen. Occasionally, yeah. so. And you see a school like ours that has the small class sizes that try to assure that, right? Yep. I mean, that's part built it baked into the mission. And you'll see that in a lot of places uh, where, you know, you have auditorium style classrooms that put 300 people in it versus a smaller school that doesn't have that reputation that um, that has just, you know, 25, 30 people in the class. Yep. And that's a more hands on experience, right? It's you're generally going to be a better learning experience. Well, wow, that's been a more in-depth topic than I, I was anticipating. I thought we were going to go through it fairly quickly, but I oh, think we, this we is, could continue kicking this ball yeah. around for hours. But this has been a this has been a great topic. I, I think hopefully this will help a lot of the readers or listeners, not readers, listeners out. Uh, I'm reading <laughs> You've been is turning on, my mind. on the automatic no, reading too much. No today. kidding. <laughs> um, hopefully this will help our our listeners out when it comes to still choosing a college, among other factors, but the importance or maybe lack thereof, depending on your situation with reputation. So before we head out, Jason, you got any parting words to say? Visit our website. That's, that's my parting words. Find, find all that good stuff about our episodes, our social media stuff, our, uh, you know, stuff on the uh, podcasting apps. There you go. Right. But hit us up should, with some messages. We want to hear from you. We should just record you saying that so I can just hit a button and it just automatically plays it. Well, I try I to say it a little bit different yeah. way every I'm time. I'm sure that yeah. I'm sure that the, the listeners appreciate the personal touch yeah, that yeah. you put on each episode. Yeah. Can't can't be canned. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's been a great show. Uh, until next time, we hope to see you there. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks for listening to the Reschooled Podcast. Be sure to head over to reschooled.com for news and other information on things we're getting into.